Okay, uh, welcome everyone. We're here for the latest of the uh, System Dynamics Seminar Series. And today we'll be focusing on COVID models at the local level. And we're very excited um, to present this to you. We have six presenters that Navaldo will um, introduce you to shortly. So if you could advance the slide. Um, just a reminder that it is the renewal period. So for 2021, if you haven't yet become a member, um, this seminar is open to everyone, but we will be having um, approximately two seminars every month, um, many of which will be free only to members. Everyone else can join in as well, but there will be a small fee if you aren't, aren't a member. And of course, um, on the next slide, we have our conference that's coming up and membership also gives you a, a discount on that conference. It will be fully virtual this year. Um, from July 25th to 30th, including the student organized colloquium and um, the regular conference sessions, as well as the two days of workshops at the end. So much like um, what we experienced last year. So be prepared for that and get that on your schedule. Um, and um, just to let you know with this, this seminar series, um, oh, I, okay, sorry, you went forward before. So this is just an, a nod to our sponsors. We are also accepting sponsorships for both the society and for the um, conference. Right now we have IC Systems, uh, California State University, MIT Sloan School of Management, Argonne National Laboratory, Copernicus Group, um, Chai and Jane Bornstein, Homer Consulting, the University of Bergen, Forio, and Safety Harbor Arts and Music Center that we would like to thank for their sponsorship. And finally, we have a disclaimer, just to let you know that these, um, these seminars represent um, work that's in progress. It hasn't always been um, you know, vetted or um, uh, been subject to review, but we're trying to enable a place for people to get together and, and talk about things as they are progressing. So just uh, letting you know about that, that we're trying to bring things to you early in the process. And we seek any sort of, um, any feedback you have on this so that we can help make this better. And I believe Navaldo has a, a survey at the end that we'll do. I'm gonna turn it over to Navaldo now. So I am Rebecca Niles, the executive director. I should have um, introduced myself of the System Dynamics Society. I'm gonna turn it over to Navaldo Redivo, who is helping to run the seminar series. Uh, hi everyone. Thanks Rebecca for introducing the seminar today. Uh, so today we're going to have um, Kim and Maris, they are two co-founders of the COVID-19 localization modeling group. And we also have in some expanded uh, youth joining us today, which is Farah, Kim, Harshita, and Brahmani. I believe Kim can introduce them better. And we're going to, we're going to be using um, Poll Everywhere to our Q&A session. So if you can QR code, um, this, let me get a pointer. You can use the QR code to read this um, QR code or access it to poll, poll. I'm sorry, pollev.com and use the STS Poll 877 and you can access the um, Q&A session. I'm gonna leave this for one second so you guys can try to QR code or access it uh, through the link. And then we can maybe start with, um, with a question or two to get used to the platform. The Q&A, uh, you can ask questions throughout the session, but we're gonna have the last 30 minutes exclusively to answer those questions, okay? So you can use the platform, uh, rate the, the questions that you like, and the top questions will be answered by the, the panel. Unfortunately, I cannot see you guys while I'm doing this. So we just have one first question. And I just want to ask you guys with swearing hand or heart, hand in your heart, are you wearing PJs right now? Let's see some answers. You can still use this QR code right here with the healthy 
the help of the dog. You see it connected there. <laughs> Can see some instars never. <laughs> Most people are wearing, not wearing PJs. I'm also not. <laughs> I have my camera off for a reason. You can see we have some people already signing there. Feel free to scan the QR code or join us via the link. Just some people can I, I'm also going to see this. It's good. Let's move on to the next, next question then. I see you guys already there, got used to it. Okay. okay the next question yep. is. So where are you joining us from? Please uh, uh, type your country so we can have an uh, idea of where are you from? USA, of course. Scotland, Bolivia, we have some people from South America, UK, States, Wales, Sweden, Germany, Singapore, all across the world, Albania, Auckland, New Zealand, Russia, a lot of people from the USA, Brazil, we have some people on chat from uh, Kuwait, Canada, Pakistan, Cyprus. This will probably cover all time zones. Italy, that's good. I can see you guys are getting used to it. So the Q&A Q Q session will be, um, you're gonna use the same platform um, and you can ask your questions throughout the, um, when the speakers are talking. And yeah, so you, you can, you can reach out to me on the chat if you have any doubts, and I'll help you out. Okay, I'm gonna hand over it to Ken. I'll stop presenting this. Stop sharing. Uh, Ken, please. Obrigado. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Can you speak a little bit louder, Ken? Okay, I can speak a little bit louder. How's that? Perfect. Very good. Okay. Uh, right, let's kick off. Uh, so uh, Maurice and, and I uh, got together back in uh, February when this COVID thing was first breaking out. And uh, we're going to tell you the, the story of our efforts about localizing a, a coronavirus model, uh, with our target being to involve young people. Uh, the young people you're going to hear from today are listed here. There's going to be a, a very brief bio of them uh, later on uh, that we'll show you. So first of all, let's um, describe our overall aims here. The, the first thing to emphasize is that COVID-19 outbreaks are local. They are very, very local. You can have a firestorm in one district and right across the street, almost nothing's happening. Uh, so that, that means that if you're going to understand what to do, you've got to understand what's happening at a local level. And the health authorities also tend to be organized at a local level. You know, hospitals serve uh, a certain catchment area, uh, local doctors serve a, a local catchment area. So both, both the outbreaks themselves and the health services that, that serve them are, are local. Uh, and that really substantially limits what you can achieve with, with national level policies. Um, I'm not saying that national level policies are completely pointless, I'm not saying that at all, but there's a limit to what you can achieve without going local. Um, and what that also means is that citizens need to understand about the outbreak in their area, because what's happening around them is, is going to be very different. You know, if there's a firestorm in your area, you need to be extra specially careful about what's going on. So what we've been trying to do is to give what everyone a tool that gives them insights about what's going on, that allows them to make well-informed uh, decisions and, and choices. Um, 
And our, our belief here is that young people can be very effective advocates in this crisis, but they've got lots of questions over on the left-hand side. They're the same questions that everybody else has got, but you know, they're, they're, they've been somewhat disenfranchised in all this. No, no one is talking to them about what they can do, distinct from uh, the adults who are, are kind of telling them what to do all the time. Um, now, in order for them to, to get informed, they need to understand how these infection models work and, and what they mean um, in their own local area. And when they've got that, then they can become well enough informed that they can uh, have really quite meaningful impact on, on, the, on the wider community. Um, through networks that they're that they're involved with, or that we can give them access to, um, through uh, the education system, or, or simply through their families and friends. So that's what we're trying to do here. Now, the elements of our program are basically this: we provided us a standard SIR model. There's nothing uh, unique about our model. It includes some things that other uh, system dynamics models don't do and it doesn't include some things that, that other models do do include we, we've chosen what to include on the basis of what is helpful for the question that we're trying to answer here but the key thing is it's an accessible model it's very easy for anybody to get at and to and to use um, and to in order for them to use it we provided a very what we hope is uh, a, a really easy learning journey for them to go through um, and th this is really in, in Maurice's uh, lap. Maurice's, I, I wouldn't like to count the hundreds of hours that Maurice has spent helping uh, people uh, on, uh, on specific cases with, with all of this. Um, and as a result of that, we can generate actual reports and presentations and get real world publicity for, for the work that they've done uh, and hopefully get that out to the communities within within which they uh, they live and and, uh, and study so this standard but accessible SEIR model uh, this is just a screenshot uh, you've got is susceptible people on the left you've got infected people in the middle you've got people who are resistant or who've died on the right hand side uh, and the model runs over two years you can shrink the window it looks at so you can look in in a matter of a, a few days if you want to or you can stretch it out from beginning of 2020 to the end of uh, 2021 um, and what what the users do what these these young people have done is they've put in local population data and other relevant data about their area they've put in what they understand to have been the local countermeasures mostly to do with limiting contacts uh, and taking um, precautions to limit the uh, the, the fraction of contacts that leads to the infection being passed on. Um, and that gives them a, a, a view of, uh, first of all, it, it explains to them what has happened in their local area up to now, and it then gives them a view looking forward as to what might happen in their area and how policy that might be employed in their local area might make a difference to that. And you'll see a lot of that in their presentations. So as far as the easy learning is concerned, we've put together a couple of very simple, short online courses. You can go and take these courses if you go to the link on this slide, sdl.re slash COVID course. We can publicize this uh, separately. Um, and course one is the, the ultimate basics. So we go right from the basics of you know, what a bathtub is, how a credit card works, how a very simple SIR model works, and then course two, it's a bit longer, um, uh, but it explains how, to, how our model works and it explains to anyone who wants to use it how to set it up for, for their area. Um, and in terms of our real world case support, I wonder if I might hand over to Maurice here actually to talk to this because he's been uh, rather the leader in all of this. Okay, um, thanks, Kim. So uh, what you're showing here is the uh, um, a series of webinars uh, for a competition that uh, we set up uh, in when the lockdown ahead of Christmas was announced here in the UK. Uh, we're based in London, and um, uh, at, in the fall, as uh, uh, people went back to school, and and uh, there was a little bit of uh, more relaxed attitude to COVID nineteen. 
Uh, it led to an explosion of infections and uh, the government uh, resisted, but eventually uh, imposed a four week lockdown uh, at, uh, at the beginning of November. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we were concerned at the time because we knew uh, from, from the earlier modeling we had done that uh, that might not be enough, but we didn't want to put it that way. So we just asked uh, the simple question uh, to anybody who wants to give it a try, what does the lockdown need to achieve in your local area? Uh, about 8,000 people had a look at the, the contest. Uh, that whittled down to about 200 people signing up and giving it a try and Farrell won. Uh, so that's that's the quick summary. And, and Kim, Kim and I created an example of a, a case for Swindon. Uh, you can look at these webinars. Uh, they're about 45 minutes long. and. Uh, uh, I think, uh, as evidenced by Ferris' success in it, uh, you know, uh, people can just uh, look at the webinars and, and successfully put together a, a set of policies for a local area. Uh, and so that that competition uh, finished at the beginning of December. Uh, the lockdown came off, and uh, Ferris' uh, analysis said that uh, we, you know, we would have to have. You'll see what her, in her presentation that we would have to have a bit more of the vigilance that uh, lockdown represented. And sure enough, uh, everybody uh, celebrated by visiting each other at Christmas and they put us straight back into the same situation again, exactly as we predicted. Um, so that that was the uh, that was uh, that competition. And uh, we were very lucky that Farah uh, uh, joined us because uh, she's been a, a big part of what we've been doing ever since. Uh, Mary, do you just want to uh, quickly introduce the students that I'll hear from? Yes, okay. So, uh, Harshita, um, now we, we've been uh, grappling with sound quality issues uh, with Harshita, uh, so hopefully she will be able to uh, present uh, her work. Uh, if not, Romani has been working with her and, and has uh, graciously agreed on short notice to, uh, to stand in for her if it isn't working okay. Uh, but Harshita is the leader of uh, uh, a group of five students that, uh, uh, with an organization called Praja, which is a, a, an open, uh, a, a governance, uh, trans governance transparency foundation in, in Mumbai. And uh, they, they, they're gonna, uh, Harshita will show you uh, their work on uh, analyzing the slums and non-slums in L Ward based on some really uh, fantastic work, work by the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. They're uh, running a seroprevalence survey in July. Uh, Bermani, uh, uh, who is is working with Harshita now on a um, uh, some some work in progress on a comparison between Mumbai and Delhi. Bermani actually lives in Hyderabad and and had started working on uh, an analysis of Hyderabad, but realized the data was awful, and and decided to instead focus on on Delhi. Um, you'll see her presentation as well. Farah, uh, I've already introduced. Uh, is the winner of our competition in, in December, and uh, she's a global health uh, student at Queen Mary University. And Quinn uh, is a, uh, when he first started working for us, I think he was still officially a sophomore in high school, and now he's a junior at Fordham Prep in the Bronx, and, and he analyzed uh, New York City, the Bronx, and Westchester, and he's going to show you uh, some of the work that he's done in the Bronx. Okay, so uh, I'm going to hand over to the students now to talk through their work, uh, and they're, they're going to go in chronological order. So Quinn, Quinn was the first to get on board with this uh, quite some time ago. Harshita then picked up the work and started on uh, Mumbai, and later involved Brahmani. Uh, we got involved with Brahmani as well to work on uh, Delhi, and Farah is the most recent. So that that's kind of explains the order in which you'll uh, you'll hear from them. So uh, let me hand over now to uh, to Quinn. All right, so uh, I'm Quinn Kennedy, and I'm going to share with you uh, my work modeling the pandemic in uh, the Bronx, which is a county in uh, New York City, and investigating the possibility of herd immunity there. So you can see, oh, uh, please back, Kim. So you can see in this uh, in this map here, which uh, shows the cases per 100,000 in uh, each of the boroughs of New York City, you can really see the difference between uh, how, even within a city, how each of the different neighborhoods are uh, are affected by the pandemic in, in drastically different ways and how important localization really is, especially between Manhattan, which fared much, much better than the Bronx. And uh, next, Kim. So when the pandemic started, 
I didn't really have any, uh, any idea of what, it, of what it really entailed and what it meant, but uh, I was certainly optimistic. I thought that we would be uh, back to normal life over the summer and maybe even back to school before the end of the year. And uh, I chose to get into this uh, type of pandemic modeling to get a better, uh, to better idea of what the future can entail if um, what would happen with, uh, especially what would, what would happen with my school. So I, I chose to, to model the Bronx because it's where my school is located. And uh, when my father told me that we wouldn't be returning to school in September, I didn't believe him for a second. I thought that that was completely outlandish and it was uh, not that serious at all. And uh, what, what in, in the beginning of, um, in the beginning of my, before we even got into the modeling, I did some crude research of my own, trying to see um, how the outbreak was going. And I could see uh, after the first wave of uh, cases in, uh, in the Bronx that roughly ended up about uh, June, that the cases per day were uh, sharply dropping off and may even remain low for the, first, uh, for the first few summer months. So I was really, really curious to see what was really happening in Bronx County. So uh, I tried, tried to get into my modeling. And uh, Nick Kim, okay. So, after I calibrated, uh, I calibrated the Bronx with the, with our model. I was really surprised, to say the least. It was uh, the model was determined to point to uh, herd immunity after after all the calibration with really reasonable parameters, and uh, you can see the lack of susceptible people in the graph on the top uh, of unaffected people, and it really shows a pretty extreme um, lack of people, even uh, which points to herd immunity in, in the area. And outside, in the, in the real world, outside of the actual model, the, the idea of herd immunity wasn't entirely, uh, wasn't entirely insane because we could see that during the summer months, we really we expect more people to uh, be going outside and contacting more people and uh, spreading the virus. But there were still uh, low case rates. The cases per day did not increase over the summer. And more importantly, during the Black Lives Matter protests in, uh, in the Bronx, where tens of thousands of people were shoulder to shoulder uh, marching through the Bronx, there was still not a, a, a uh, significant increase in case rates. We did hear, however, uh, anecdotally from a uh, doctor in New York City that the, uh, the policemen in the city had a increase in uh, case rates, but the uh, county as a whole did not have any significant increase, which was really strong evidence of, um, of herd immunity, of possible herd immunity in the area. So to stress test my, uh, my hypothesis, I changed uh, 14 of the most uh, relevant parameters like uh, contact rates and self-reporting rates of, um, of uh, symptoms and to see how the, uh, how the model reacted to see if there's any, um, any changes. And the only, uh, the only parameter that led to a, uh, that led to a, had a negative impact in what the model was saying was the percent of the population with very low symptoms, but to, to, to calibrate the model with this uh, change in parameter, I had to make, I had to alter other parameters to uh, fit the real world case data. And, uh, and the, the way I altered these other parameters was, was uh, way too extreme. And uh, it kind of it, it reinforced the idea that this was not, um, that altering this parameter wasn't really what was happening because of, the, um, of how extreme the other, the other parameters really were. So that also, that kind of invalidated that parameter to, uh, point to herd immunity. So unfortunately, uh, our predictions were uh, much too good to be true because the case totals doubled from a, uh, from a massive second wave beginning in about November, which you can see in, this, uh, in these daily cases here on this top graph. And it, there's, there, could be many, uh, there could be many reasons for this, such as uh, returning back to school and uh, as well as people losing uh, their, uh, their immunity. But uh, one, the most, probably the most crucial piece of evidence that we overlooked and would have definitely restructured our, uh, our assumptions was a 22% uh, seroprevalence value, which came from uh, plasma samples of 10,000 New Yorkers uh, at July 5th. And this would almost, almost completely and really directly rule out the possib possibility of herd immunity at the time. Because if we know that um, from a pretty extensive study, if we know that only 22% of the people uh, have antibodies, it, it's much, much farther from the uh, around 80% needed for herd immunity in the area. However, we do know that uh, the seroprevalence can rapidly rise from the Mumbai, Mumbai case. So it could, there's a possibility, but it definitely um, was a 
that would definitely hindered our uh, our hypothesis there. And if there's uh, one big takeaway that we, uh, or a couple, a couple of big takeaways that I really learned from this uh, study, it's to always ask yourself, uh, what am I assuming in this, in my hypothesis? And uh, what can I possibly go wrong? Like if we, we really needed to, um, really needed to test ourselves more often and see what assumptions we were making, see how, how valid they were, to see how reasonable uh, our ideas were and possibly tailor our uh, hypothesis around that. And uh, that could have changed our, um, that could have changed our hypothesis to see, uh, to see a more reasonable uh, outcome. So, and also in hindsight, we, uh, there are other, other possible sources of error that you can see here below in the, the second graph and um, in these values, such as uh, uh, contacts per day being too high, a, a mild case reporting rate being much too high, and they are uh, a uh, much too high uh, of a uh, severe lockdown. And that is the Bronx County. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Quinn. Um, by the way, we we decided to keep the flow going and, and give us a good uh, chance for debate at the end that we could run straight through uh, the cases and, and have open up for questions uh, afterwards. So I hope that's OK with everybody. Um, so now we're going to look at the Mumbai and Delhi cases. So let's see if Harshita is able to uh, speak and uh, more importantly, if we're able to hear her. Harshita, are you there? He's asking to be unmuted. Ah, right. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so my, I have some problem with my bank connection. I think I'm heard better now. It's good. Okay, so far. It's fine, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in, in this next part of the presentation, we'll talk about the model that we built for the slum area of El Ward, Mumbai. And then we built a similar contrasting model for non-slum areas of Mumbai. Then in the later part of the presentation, we will see how we imply the insight that we got from Mumbai to the uh, movement of the virus in Delhi. Uh, next slide, please. Before I actually go on to talk about how did we simulate the results, I want to uh, briefly explain the setup of El Ward Mumbai. This was in itself. It is quite evident that in the non-slum areas, uh, we have better living conditions, better access to resources, and lower density of population. Whereas the slum areas are densely packed, they have higher density of population per square kilometer, and have poor access to healthcare facilities. The living conditions in these two areas are diametrically opposite. Now, in our simulation, we will see how did the virus differently move in these two areas. Next slide, please. Now, we'll start to talk about how is the virus moving in the slum areas of L1. Um, uh, one important note here is we assume that the entire population of L1 is a slum inhabitant. We started our study way back in August 2020. When we started um, building this model, the total susceptible count was declining gradually. But uh, when we reached to October 2020, the susceptible count became almost negligible, which means a simultaneous increase in the total currently infected. In the month July August 2020, the slum districts of L Ward witnessed a, see, a huge peak in the cases. By December, nearly everyone in the slums was infected by the virus or developed resistance to the virus. One important thing to note here is, why did the virus move so quickly in the slums of Mumbai? Firstly, contacts per person per day. This was because of high density of population. Limited access to proper healthcare facilities. Now, experimentation. And this experimentation helps us to judge the accuracy of our entire simulation process. The blue line here represents the total model cases, whereas the red line represents the actual reported cases. Uh, to, be, to note, the actual cases are lifted so as they can prove the results obtained from the zero prevalent survey. Our results are very consistent with the reported cases in L1 Mumbai. Now, when we go on to talk about the total deaths that might have occurred in L1, 
uh, in the previous year. Uh, it might have occurred in uh, the previous slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, now when we talk about the total deaths, there is a gap between the model deaths and the actual reported deaths. This gap is filled by underreporting of deaths. The essential reports which claim that might have underreporting of total deaths. Hashita, I'm afraid. Hashita, I'm afraid we're losing you. We can't hear you. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? You're back. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the zero prevalence survey, which was conducted way back in July 2020, 7% um, of the slum population had developed some kind of end, which means that 57% of the total population in the slums was infected by the Now, we go on to talk about the non-slum areas of L ward number. The orange line here depicts the movement of the virus for the non-slum districts. For non slum 16% of antibodies way back in July, which means that the virus was moving at a speed of one third in the non-slums compared to that of the slums. Until September 2020, the susceptible count until 2020 September, the susceptible count was declining uh, with a very gradual way. But from the urban lockdown that occurred in October 2020, we see a steep decline in the total susceptible count. And this happened because of the locking of the economy. Easy commutation led to a seven times surge in cases compared to that of April. 2020 between the months of December and February 2021 in the non-slum areas of Mumbai. Uh, we'll go on to talk about something which is very interesting about the non-slum areas. As I have mentioned, three times slower than that of the slums. So it is highly possible. So it is highly possible that uh, the non-slum area will witness a three times surge in the total death experience in near future. And now, Ramani will take over and explain how is the virus moving in Delhi. Thank you. Thank you, Harshita. Coming to Delhi, we built the model in August 2020. It must be noted that the model is built for the whole of Delhi due to the unavailability of region-wise data. As for the seroprevalence survey conducted in early July, 23% of this population was already infected. Using this survey and the case data, the localized model was built. The model's insights accurately mirrored the real occurrences. These graphs taken from the model show the progress of the pandemic in Delhi. The model predicted a possible second wave in November and that Delhi would hit its peak in mid-December, which can be seen in the cases per day chart. You can also see a steep fall in susceptibles during this period. I'd now like to bring your attention to deaths per day. Deaths are usually a reliable marker to know the spread of the virus. But Delhi had many cases of underreporting, leading to a difference of 20,000 between the actual and the moral deaths. Next slide. Thank you. So Delhi and Mumbai might seem to resemble each other on the surface, but, the, but their inherent differences led the pandemic affecting them very differently. The Municipal Corporation of Delhi constitutes three separate bodies, while the MCGM is one integrated body thus making space for better policy coordination and records management. Delhi has no region-wise data available, whereas Mumbai has a ward-wise breakdown of data. Delhi, with the aid of central and state governments, has conducted about 82 lakh tests, while Mumbai has conducted 27 lakh. Though this is applaudable, Delhi uses rapid antigen tests, while Mumbai relied more on RT-PCR tests, which are way more accurate. Coming to the registered deaths, the Delhi model uplifted 10,000 reported deaths to 35,000. Similarly, in Mumbai, a total of 13,000 deaths were added. This raises the question, do the registered deaths measure the actual scenario? How much of this difference can be attributed to the asymptomatic testing? The graph here shows reported deaths per capita for Delhi, the slums, and the non-slums of Elward, Mumbai. Uh, it, can be seen, yeah, it can be seen that Delhi is in between the slums and non-slums of Mumbai. 
This projection may, however, disguise huge differences between the slums and the non-slums of Delhi. It's important to note here that this analysis is for the whole of Delhi, made using the seroprevalence data for the whole region. It's essentially the average of slums and non-slums, and considering this might be an, might be extremely misleading. This might be hiding a possible massive surge in the non-slums of Delhi. The slums and the non-slums of Delhi might be imitating Mumbai, but the absence of distinct seroprevalence data for these areas restricts us from further analyzing them separately. Next slide, please. Yeah, let's move on to the recommendations. For the non-slums of Mumbai that are currently on the verge of a massive spike, we suggest that the authorities continue testing both symptomatic and asymptomatic people using the RT-PCR kits. We also recommend they conduct a seroprevalence survey with a large and diverse sample size to know the actual spread of the virus. For the slums, authorities might have to monitor the infections and use available models to keep track of the same. They also need to promote synergy between the local government leaders and the residents and help improve hygiene standards. Coming to Delhi, we recommend the authorities continue extensive, extensive testing but shift to RT-PCR kits from the rapid antigen kits. The susceptible count is an important marker in assessing the future impact of the virus. Delhi, which has about 7 million susceptibles by January 2021, might be on the verge of another spike in cases. Hence, the authorities should continue limiting contacts per day per person by making use of makeshift quarantine facilities. On to general observations. India, being a federal country, has to make sure that the central government and the union health minister coordinate with state governments to curb the virus. The government has to assess the impact of the vaccination program and make sure everyone is vaccinated. Although the new B117 variant has not spread much in India, the authorities have to be apprehensive and quickly isolate those who are infected with it. I'd now like Harshita to talk about our experiences while building the models. Uh, uh, am I heard well? If not, then I guess Brahmani, you can take over and uh, continue with it. No, we can hear you. Okay. okay. That's good then. Uh, so building such kind of simulations uh, beautifully engage different academic disciplines. I am from political science background, but was successfully able to build a model for everyone. We're losing you again, Hashita. We're losing you again. Okay. Uh, Ramani. I think Ramani, you can continue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Hashita is basically from a political science background, and I am from a computer science background. But even being from wildly different backgrounds and Hashita with no uh, basic knowledge of modeling, she was still able to build the whole model for Mumbai and she was able to analyze the slums and non-slums properly. The second part is that localization is very important because uh, for each place, the characteristics and the inherent, inherent uh, details are very important and only by using such localized models can we understand how different they are. And how we can uh, and how the future of the virus will be. And uh, comparing L ward and Delhi showed us the the similarities and differences in demographic and the and how the administration uh, how the administration is done is very important in such cosmopolitan cities to uh, understand how the virus is spreading and what the future steps will be to curb the virus. Uh, just as we use insights from the Mumbai model to assess the situation in Delhi, we can use insights from one region to study another region and the progress of the disease in that region. Modeling these uh, Delhi and Mumbai models helped us understand how different factors impact each other and the varying effect of the spread and, varying, and the varying effects of these impacts on the spread of the virus. They also helped us gauge what the true scenarios were and how different they were from that that were being portrayed by the government. All in all, this is a very powerful tool that is useful in the hands of ordinary citizens like us that can help us understand and take measures to curb the pandemic. And that brings us to the end of our part of the presentation. We'd oh. definitely like to thank Mr. Morris Flaxman and Kim Warren for giving us this wonderful chance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for that uh, uh, tour de force on Mumbai and uh, Delhi. Thank you. Uh, so let's hand over to uh, Farah, who's going to tell us about her work on Westminster. Great, thank you. So um, I'm at university currently and I'm doing a global health course. So I was really interested in the situation surrounding coronavirus. 
Um, although I had no prior knowledge about modelling, the tutorials provided for the competition by Kim and Maurice were really helpful um, and gave me the knowledge to work with the model. So I modelled the City of Westminster in London. Um, I wanted to be able to see the results that a lockdown as well as masks and policies had on the coronavirus spread. Um, I gather data from the NHS and Westminster Council for the cases, demographics and hospital admissions. Um, this was also used to predict the results if preventative measures such as the lockdown were implemented. Um, the COVID competition that I enrolled in was set up during the second lockdown in the UK. So I expected coronavirus cases to increase after the lockdown and in the winter holidays as more people were going out. Um, however, as there were also talks about vaccines at the time, I wondered if vaccines alone were able to decrease the cases and deaths completely. Great, so the model calculated the effects that the lockdown had on the number of cases and deaths. So through inputting data about coronavirus cases and deaths, I was able to model how vaccines and vigilance over the coming weeks were able to reduce the deaths and severe infections by 70%. Um, so the colours, as you can see, show the different scenarios. The blue line is with the lockdown only, and it shows what the model predict, predict, projects would happen without vaccines or further vigilance to slow the spread. Um, and although the, uh, the lockdown is better than no measures, we can see that the cases and deaths are the highest in comparison to the other scenarios. The green line shows what would happen with the rapid vaccination programme, but limited efforts to slow the spread. This shows a similar but no lower number of cases, but will decrease the total deaths by 30%. The pink line shows what can be achieved with a vaccine programme, as well as continued efforts to control the spread through vigilance, especially protect protecting vulnerable people. Overall showing a decrease in the number of projected deaths by 70%. So different to what I previously thought, I found that vaccines alone weren't enough to stop the COVID cases and the population still needed to abide by the social distancing rules. Um, so the model also helped to estimate the invis um, invisibles that make the COVID-19 so difficult to detect and control. So the top two graphs are the same as the previous slides, um, with the same colours for each scenario. Uh, we can also see that the lockdown finishes, um, more people go outside, so the number of susceptible people um, decrease because more people are getting the virus, which also increases the number of resistant people. However, it also increases the number of deaths. So these graphs show that a vaccines only scenario show a very fast decrease in susceptible people and an increase in resistance as those vaccinated will become mostly immune. However, vaccines still only have a 30% decrease in deaths due to the program not being rolled out fast enough. Um, so we can see that the pink line for vaccines and vigilance are the most effective at decreasing the number of people infected. Um, so these graphs show the changes in data if a coronavirus mutation that 70% more infectious impacts the population of Westminster. So the first graph looks at the effects of cases. The blue line shows the results of no mutations as well as no actions or preventative measures um, in comparison to the gray line, which with the 70% more infectious mutation, we can see that this has around a 50% increase for the daily number of cases. So graphs two and three um, look at the deaths with and without the mutation. So the pink line of vaccine and vigilance show the scenario that has the biggest effect on the decreasing deaths compared to no action. Um, so we can see that around 250 lives can be saved with the extra precaution. Um, and with a mutation, there is around a 50% increase in deaths compared to no mutation. Um, and this is without any action. Uh, the orange line shows that vaccines alone will only decrease the deaths by a small amount um, as they may be too late. Uh, so we can overall see the same results as previously, that the vaccines and vigilance together, which is the purple line, decrease the deaths by almost 50% with the mutation. Um, so in the bottom graphs, the, invis um, the invisibles compare the total infections between graphs four and five, show a much higher peak of the graph for the mutation. And graph six is also very important. Um, as for the model I looked at, um, I looked at hospitals in Westminster and cal calculated the number of available beds and ICU beds through NHS data. So due to a surge in COVID hospital admissions, hospital staff will become overwhelmed and may have to send um, some people home if they're not um, as, as endangered. So we can see that with a mutation, the number of people sent home are around 50% more than with no mutation. Um, and we can see that the mutation increases the reproduction number of the virus, resulting in many more severe infections and deaths. Um, and we can also see that the purple line with vaccine and vigilance will decrease the number of people sent home the most. Um, so furthermore from this, we can see the importance of the lockdown and preventative measures, even if the vaccine programme is implemented. So this calls for um, policies 
but to implement tighter restrictions to prevent these results um, as they are shown to be very effective. Lovely. Uh, and what has in, in fact happened is that hospitals have been horribly uh, overloaded in, in the UK um, in that third uh, wave of, in, of infections, although you're probably not actually seeing people being sent home. It's being uh, intercepted before that and people are maybe not getting into hospital who, who otherwise uh, should be. Now, if all goes well, Farah should be able to um, share yes. her screen and actually show, show the working model um, and how the uh, mutation was uh, was tested. Yes, so I hope you can all see the screen. Um, so this is the model and you can see that you can input data um, everywhere and over here in the green section you can see total number of cases per day and all of the results. Um, on the side on the left if you pull it out you can see um, the scenarios at the bottom and the blue line is currently showing the base case. Um, so from changing the variables and inputting the 70% more infectious um, mutation, we can see the gray line has a very large increase in the total number of cases per day, number of cases infected um, and total resistance as well as deaths. Um, so you're welcome, yeah. Lovely, thank you, uh, thank you, Farah. Thank you. Um, so um, we've now got to the, uh, the end of the, of the case presentations. Uh, and we'll have a few words to say later about our, our, our overall learning from th this whole uh, process. Um, but uh, uh, maybe Nivaldo, Nivaldo could uh, help us now facilitate any, any questions that have come in uh, for really for the students uh, rather than asking me about this, um, uh, ask, the, ask the students. Uh, yes. Oh, hold on, I'm not showing my screen, am I? Uh, Q&A time, Nivaldo? Yes, I need to share my screen, Ken, though. Yeah, sure. Let me just get the right tab here. Just a second, this needs to load a little bit. If you, if you haven't um, get to this um, website up here in the slide, you can see um, the link, spolev.com slash SDS post 877. And we already have some questions, Kim. I'll go ahead and pick the most, the ones with the most likes. Um, so this one is the first one is could it, could be could this be applied to other areas of concern, say climate change or food security, to demonstrate inequities? When you say applied to, uh, I, I guess uh, the the question is referring to the localization uh, principle. Um, so we we believe that that localization can be, can be applied to uh, to to many. Uh, phenomena that are going on, but of course the, the climate change dynamics as a whole are, are planet-wide. Um, there may be cases where uh, that there are specific local implications of climate change that, that we could uh, look at that with um, uh, this kind of approach to localization. But I think the, the big principle here is that this goes something back to something that, that Forrester said uh, half a century ago, you know, we, we should not be tackling a problem. We should be tackling a whole class of problems and replicating the solution of, across all of those uh, similar cases. Uh, food, food security too, I guess there, there would be um, lo very localized uh, implications from, uh, from climate change. So uh, I think the short answer to that is yeah, yes, in some cases. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Kim. Um, next one is how can this model help decision makers make better decisions? Maurice, do you want to take one or two of these questions? How about that? Okay. Um, well, I think you know, we, we have been working closely with uh, decision makers in Mumbai um, to the Project Foundation. And uh, they've been translating uh, the work of uh, Harshita and her uh, 
fellows at uh, uh, in in uh, at Praja uh, and, and interpreting that for the local authorities and and uh, I I suppose you could say nudging them in in, in, a, in a helpful direction. Uh, so we do have a real example of that happening. Um, uh, that said, uh, most policymakers that we're aware of are not using local localization at this great level of granularity. And I, I think uh, you know hopefully it's uh, abundantly clear from the presentations that it does deliver really good insights uh, about how policies uh, should be uh, adjusted, uh, you know, in, in very close proximity. You know, you, you can see in that photograph that Burma, uh, Burmani and Harshita showed with the slums versus the non-slums in Mumbai. They are literally right next to each other, and and the policies are unrecognizably different for those two areas. Plus, the two areas interact, and I think it's it's just. Uh, self-evident that it would be a great idea for policymakers to adopt this approach. Um, you know, we are working on a, uh, a, an idea called mass localization uh, where we automate this and uh, we, we hope that that will turn into a practical policy tool, uh, not just for uh, healthcare, but also uh, for other, other uh, classes of problems as Kim said, such as uh, um, marketing as an example and the supply chain dynamics are another example. Uh, there, there are many, many examples. Um, so and I think in all, in all of those cases, both from a, a public policy and also a business policy perspective, you know, it's, it's widely applicable. Nivelda, can we just look out for any questions that are specifically for yeah, you? Yeah, you can. If there are any. Is there any you want to answer from this one? Can you repeat what equation you use to graph visualize the map? I'm not I, sure. Sorry, I don't understand that question. That was, at the, that was entered at the beginning um, on the first presentation from Quinn, I think. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it was related to... Quinn, Quinn do, you, do you understand the question? Uh, sure. So I'm not sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what uh, equation the, the question is talking about. I wonder if it's the SEIR, Kim. Don't know. Um, well, if, if it's just the oh, I think it's just from the map on the first slide. That was just the uh, the number of cases per hundred thousand, and it was just showing um, the difference between uh, how Manhattan was affected by the pandemic and how like the other boroughs of the New York City were affected by the pandemic. Oh that, right. right. Yeah, you'll find you'll find similar maps for for almost any city, uh, and I, I was pretty shocked, I have to say, at just how very uh, different the, uh, the the case rates are in in very small um, areas. I I said from the start with this model that, that it should not be used for areas that were not relatively self-contained, by which by which we meant that the um, daily traffic between the area and surrounding areas must be small relative to the mingling of people within within the district. And we, we felt that that would be true of any city, that there was no chance that, that it would be uh, so um, so varied between, between districts. And I, I was just plain wrong. Um, it turns out that the um, dynamics within small small districts are, are well able to overwhelm any influences of, uh, of people moving in and out of, of a district um, in that way. Oh, on, the, on, the date, on the data question, Maurice, do you want to take that? Oh, uh, uh, right. Okay. Um, so uh, all of the students were just working with uh, the, the case data, and uh, that's new cases per day. That's what generally published, plus uh, information on deaths. Now, the, the critical thing is this needs to be matched up with data on uh, the demographics of a local area because COVID-19 in particular uh, is very sensitive to the uh, the age demographics. Uh, so uh, you need you need to have a, a, a a mapping between the, the case data and, and the age demographics, plus the hospital uh, beds uh, available is important. And uh, we, we sometimes were able to get information about when people were uh, entering an area, but uh, often we had to back into that uh, by inference. And finally, and most importantly, uh, 
the, the most helpful data of all is the seroprevalence surveys, especially when they were done uh, in a local area, uh, because the, uh, the granularity that we had in Mumbai was was absolutely superb for uh, getting good insights about the two areas there. And I don't think we would have gotten nearly as much insight without that. Regarding the longer term outlook, um, I, I think we've all been uh, kind of slightly shocked and disappointed that um, the, the outbreak that we thought we all thought would be over or pretty much over by now uh, seems to show no signs of actually being over. Um, and we, we keep on um, coming across issues that we have to, to add. Um, in order to update what, what's going on. So the arrival of, a new, of that new mutation in London was, uh, was an example of that. Um, and we, we can, of course, pu push through uh, the possibility that, that other new variants um, uh, arise there. We can push through an assumption that the vaccines that we're relying on uh, turn out to be um, uh, unable to fight off some mystery new variant that, that has yet to be achieved. That's not the case right now. The, the vaccines do seem to be able to hit back most variants of the virus at the moment. Um, but we, we, we think uh, it, it, is, it looks likely that the combination of um, uh, poor policy to hold down the transmission of uh, cases between people and the possibility of new variants emerging means that we're basically going to be bouncing along with an underlying level of this thing really for, for quite a long time. Uh, that, that's my, my personal interpretation of, of what we've seen. I don't know if Maurice would have a different Yeah, I, 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 just in the interest of time, I think we're, uh, we're coming up to the hour now. Uh, yeah. But you know, one, one thing that uh, we really uh, have appreciated and wanted to emphasize, and I, I was hoping to ask the students to comment on, uh, you know, how is this, how has this affected their uh, perception of uh, what's happening in the pandemic? How is it affecting uh, their personal advocacy of better policies to their friends and family? And how has it affected uh, their education overall? Uh, you know, what, what uh, knock-on effects has this had on, on the way that they think about uh, solving problems and, and tackling things in other, other areas? Uh, maybe if we just start with Quinn and march through. Well, it's definitely affected uh, my perception of uh, the pandemic and how uh, policymakers should uh, create their, their their ideas and their policy from um, just how uh, complex it all really is. Like back in uh, March and uh, before the end of last year, before the summer, uh, I thought I had such a good understanding of um, what was going to happen. I thought the model was predicting our herd immunity, and we we had it uh, we had it down. We understood what was going on, but then there was this massive second wave, which kind of took at least me by surprise. And uh, I think policymakers should definitely um, use as much information as they possibly can and be as conservative as they can to, um, to make the best estimates. And uh, I also, I hope to use some of this modeling maybe in the future to, uh, and like many, many, other, um, in many other different applications such as like uh, in financial modeling, I think it could be extremely useful. And uh, especially the, the automated modeling that um, is being done at MIT could definitely uh, make this so much more useful to everybody else. Um, what about uh, Har Harshita and Bramani? Um, uh, your, your reaction to the same questions? Uh, I, I definitely see that modeling, I mean, working on this model definitely improve how I changed my perspective on how I view things because I still remember we had this meeting with Mr. Morris where I said that Delhi has reached his peak, Delhi has reached its peak in uh, September or so, and then we sat on it and we changed it, the smallest of the parameters, and then there was the possibility of such a huge peak, which uh, is much greater than the first one. So I understood that the smallest of the parameters and the smallest of the changes can actually make a huge difference, and. Uh, I'm a computer, I'm like, I'm a student of computer science. So I've done some modeling beside this, but there's a lot of difference between the models that I build and this one. And I think this is, uh, it's very useful in terms that it actually takes real, uh, the smallest parameters into account. I, that's the whole thing for me, because when I model stuff, I don't usually take 
everything into consideration but here we are literally i mean we are literally taking normal contacts per and things that no one would actually think of considering into it and building a model on it so that's something which i learned from this uh, ex- like from this experience thank you everyone what about harshita can we hear her um am i heard i don't think so. yes yes yeah, yeah. okay so uh, as i said earlier i study political public administration so um, we always have this uh, idea to make better public and i think with this entire process of building this model i kind of policies and um, what should be the focus area of the policies that we uh, make for a given area so uh, this modeling this entire simulation process made me understand that is important to look at every area in a different way because every thing expects a different computer and uh, as resources to it yeah that's it. thank you thank you and what about vera uh, yeah so this um modeling has been really useful as i've really been able to understand more effects surrounding coronavirus um especially with the importance of staying vigilant um and this is very important for people who maybe don't understand um so much about the um in, like the preventative measures or some people who choose not to listen because you can clearly see from the model the impacts that it will have uh, and it shows the real life consequences such as the increase in cases and deaths um and i think that this problem solving approach being used in the real world issue of the pandemic can help to later come up with solutions and policies um because you're able to kind of put in different scenarios and see which one is the most effective and the most beneficial um especially with issues such as the economy so it's able to kind of help that thank you us uh ebaldo if if we have got just a couple of minutes i i can quickly whiz through a couple of those questions there uh we, we can try and answer some um after the event as well um information on the on the model and the software you'll find in the in the link to the course uh, the courses that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation um does the lo- uh, definition of local ever change um the, the definition of, of local really uh, depends on on is is there a significant difference um in the area you're considering uh to to how the outbreak is progressing compared with areas around it um okay what well, most effective vaccine uh, uh most people think a more effective vaccine is better for them is there any way to show that a more rapid rollout of us we're um, working on that question now <laughs> yeah we're certainly looking at that right now um uh, and the the policy here in the UK is is to get a first dose out to more people rather than uh, two two doses close together to fewer people uh, and the evidence actually from the vaccine providers is that that does seem to be the, the better strategy uh, how are we defining youth um uh, ba- basically um young undergraduates and below uh, we we we're not excluding kind of masters level students or or phd students not excluding anybody uh but we did especially want to reach uh high school students and and undergrads but just just a, a clarification on that Kim. you know what one of the things that's unique about this pandemic is asymptomatic uh, uh in, infections mm. and uh very very heavily biased to older over people who are severely affected so in a way what we had is a bunch of uh older folks telling a bunch of younger folks what to do and, and the younger folks weren't really affected and that's why we targeted young people yeah uh to try and uh you know repair that policy uh failure uh that that young people were not involved and yet they were critical and in uh you know to to uh, as a society change of behavior so it, there is no age discrimination here in terms of who can use this model it's, it's simply that we saw that there was a policy failure that needed to be addressed amongst young people and that's why we targeted it there Uh, Nivel though are we able to presumably we can we can share the the uh, slides afterwards and um, and that will include quite a lot of um, links through to other information uh, yes so i can make it available in the similar series page um it's uh, systemdynamics.org/seminar series if i'm not mistaken um it's not there the, yet 
for the campaign. It's not there yet. It's going to be available after this so with us some delay. Uh, do you want to pick any of those questions, Kim? Uh, if you can guess us the questions we, we can that we haven't answered, we can see if we can yeah. uh, get you some answers to those. I know how frustrating it is to put questions into these systems and not get them answered during a webinar. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do to get you answers. Uh, so I didn't get that, uh, that uh, Kim. Do you mean you... you if you, you want get the questions that are outstanding from the, the polling system, we, we will try to answer those questions. Yep, if they're in a Word document, we can attach that to the, to the page as well. Okay. Yeah, so the answer to vaccines is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have also some questions and comments in here saying how um, this impressive work and thank you all you guys for this amazing work. Um, so that will also be available for you guys. Um, so I'll stop sharing. Do you want to have some final considerations, Kim? Uh, yes, if I could jump back. Good point. Uh, if I can share my screen, where's that gone? Yeah. Right, so our conclusion from this, I, I think we, we've we've confirmed certainly to our satisfaction, I don't know if it's to everybody else's, but uh, system dynamics models really can and, and they really should be accessible. We, we've been kind of mysterious for, for far too long with, with SD models. Uh, they shouldn't be mysterious, they should be open to people. Um, and bright young people can get it um, with, without too much difficulty if, if, uh, if presented with the information in a, in a reasonably organized way. Um, we, we're going on to do, to do other things. I think Maurice already mentioned the, uh, the technical work that's going on to see if we can uh, mass customize the, this model, um, which, which would give, give young people access, much quicker access to, oh, so this is what's happening around, around me, uh, but, but we're not there yet. I, I'm sorry, we, we might be a bit late to provide people with the with the uh, benefits that would, might come out of that, um, and the the links at the bottom of the slide um, will take you to uh, all, um, all of the background information that you might might want to know. Some articles that uh, Maurice has pushed through to publication on uh, some of the local studies that have been done, uh, the course itself, um, and uh, we we can answer questions at that email as well. But you'll you'll get that in the um, in the handouts at the end. Anything else I've forgotten, Maurice? No, I, I, well, there is one other thing. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it, it's been uh, a fascinating journey. I, I think uh, we're coming up to a year, Kim and, Kim and I are working on this now. And I, I feel like we're just uh, tapping, at, at, we're just scratching the surface uh, of the potential for this. Um, and uh, we, we've benefited, uh, we should thank uh, literally hundreds of other people who contributed. We, you know, uh, the, many of them are named on our on our course website, uh, but this has been uh, a, a huge effort, not just by Kim and I, but uh, uh, at, at least a hundred other people. Uh, and uh, I wish I could uh, have time to thank them all, but uh, uh, we 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 wouldn't have been able to get this done without them. And special thanks to the students, uh, uh, in, including the ones here, but also the dozens of other students that we've worked with. Uh, who have allowed us to, uh, to to make all this progress? Uh, it 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 has genuinely been a, a team effort, and uh, uh, everybody involved has been a volunteer. Uh, Thank so, you for uh, as well. And thank you so much, Kim. I'm just letting you guys know that there is a lot of information on the events page where you register for this webinar. So if you go there, you can find all the links uh, from the group's work. And also the link for the cars. If you go there, you don't need to wait for uh, to come up with them in the webinar and seminar series page. Uh, Rebecca, do you have any final um, considerations too? No, I would just like to thank everyone for being here and uh, suggest that you take a look at our seminar series page and our event calendar in general. We have a lot of um, interesting things coming up, and we hope you will join us. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all.